Hi, good day. On this video lecture, so we are going to cover discussions on operating system processes. So here's the outline of the presentation. So we are going to deal with the following. So you've got a process concept, process scheduling, operations on processes, the inter-process communication, IPC or the inter-process communication in a shared memory systems, the inter-process communication in message passing systems. So we we'll also deal with examples of the inter-process communication systems and the communication in the client server systems. All right. So the objective of our video or objectives of the video so would be the following. So first, identify the separate components of a process and illustrate how they are represented and scheduled in an operating system. Okay? So second is describe how processes are created and terminated in an operating system. So including developing programs using the appropriate system calls that perform these operations. Okay? So third is to describe and contrast the inter-process communication using shared memory and message passing. Fourth is design programs that uses pipes and POSIX shared memory to perform the inter-process communication or IPC. So to describe the client-server communication using sockets and remote procedure calls. All right? And last would be to design kernel modules that interact with the Linux operating systems. So let's start. So let's start with the definition of a process. So what is a process in an operating system? Okay. So basically when you say process, we're talking about the instance of program execution. Okay. A process is basically a program in execution. So process execution must progress in sequential fashion. No parallel execution of instructions of a single process. So basically, in layman's term, when you say process, we run the program, it creates a process. The program itself that is not running is not considered to be a process. So you run the applications and that would become a process. Okay? So, but systems works in terms of jobs. So on this discussion, the process or the term process and jobs are used interchangeably. So process is also the same as jobs and we talk about a program in execution. Okay? So many, many modern process concepts are still expressed in terms of jobs. That's why some books you'll be hearing job scheduling. Okay? Or that is also the same with process scheduling or we call it CPU scheduling. Okay? So these terms are used interchangeably throughout the discussion here. Okay? So a process basically composed of multiple parts, okay? So you've got the program code, also called the text section. So currently, our current activity including the program counter, processor registers, okay? So stack containing the temporary data. So function parameters, return addresses, and local variables. So you also have data section containing the global variables and the heap containing memory dynamically allocated during runtime. Okay, so a program is either passive or active. Okay, so program is passive entity stored on the disk. These are the executable file. Okay, and when you say process, we're talking about the active. Okay, active program or running program. So that is what we call a process okay so a program becomes a process only when an executable file is loaded into the memory and being executed by the CPU okay so execution of programs started via GUI okay so via mouse click so take note that when you click on the application you are actually starting a process okay or in the command line you simply type in the command okay so just make sure it is executable and that creates a process Right, so one program can have 
several processes. Consider multiple users executing the same program. Okay? Next. So this diagram here represents a process in a memory. Okay? So basically, as mentioned earlier, a process has the following. So it has a stack, heap, data, and text. Okay? So process memory is divided into this four sections as you can see here. You've got the stack, the heap, the data, and the text. So let's start with the text section. Okay? So the text section comprises the compiled program code, read in from a non-volatile storage when the program is launched. Okay? So the next one is data section. It stores global and static variables allocated and initialized prior to executing the main function in a program. Okay, so that is why, for example, in C++, we'll have the main function. Okay? Next is the heap. Okay? So what is a heap? Heap is used for dynamic memory allocation and is managed by calls to new, delete, the malloc, or, or the memory allocation, free, and other commands, etc. Okay? So the next one is a stack. So a stack is used for local variables. So space on the stack is reserved for local variables when they are declared okay, at a function entrance or maybe elsewhere depending on the language. All right. And the space is freed up when the variables go out of the scope. Okay. So note that the stack is also used for function return values. And the exact mechanism of stack management may be language specific. So maybe you are you, you still remember okay so programming all right so we have declaration of the local and global variables in there so that works on the stack okay so note that the stack and the heap start at opposite ends of the process free space and grow towards each other so you'll have the space here okay and if they should ever meet then either the stack overflow error will occur okay else a call to a new or memory allocation or malloc will fail due to insufficient memory available okay so when a process are swapped out of the memory and later restored additional information must also be stored and restored so key among them are the program counter and the value of all the program registers all right next so i have here an example of a memory layout of a c program so this is what uh, what has been explained on the previous slides wherein every time you declare variables so every time we we declare an identifier so they are mapped into the memory okay so the lower portion of memory is the text so what you call the text and these variables here are occupying the other portions of the memory all right now so when you say process as what i've said earlier this is a program in execution okay so if we are talking about the processes of this computer let me show you that okay so let me open a task manager here okay so um, this task manager here okay shows the number of processes running so basically they are represented by apps okay you've got the user processes here and i also have here some background processes all right now in here you will observe the allocation of the resources all right so for the allocation of the resources so basically your operating systems allocates the cpu so currently i'm using 20 percent of it the memory, disk, network, and others. Now, what I want you to pay attention with is the performance here. And take a look at the number of processes which are being run by this computer. Okay, so let me expand this. So we've got processes here, okay. And then performance, all right. So these are the resources available. On the CPU, when you click on the CPU, you'll have the processes there, right? 
So currently this computer is running 170 processes but if you will observe you will only see some of the processes here because majority of the processes being run by your computer is part of the system or part of the operating system. All right. So again, we have processes here that means this computer is running 170 program at the current state. Okay? And there are about 2370 plus plus threads. Okay? Now let's talk about the process state. Okay? So each process, each application we open and run passes through this state. Okay? So basically, we're going to start with new. New is when the process is created. Running, instructions are being executed. Waiting, the process is waiting for some event to occur. You've got uh, ready, the process is waiting to be assigned to a processor and terminated, the process has finished the execution. Okay, so representing in terms of a diagram here, so this represents the process state. So initially, when you open the application, we are actually creating a new process. Okay, the process is in the stage of being created. So that's what we meant by new. Okay, and then once admitted onto the memory, so it will now be in ready state. So ready means the process has all the resources available that it needs to run but the CPU is not currently working on its process instructions so basically before we run an application before it is considered to be a process this application needs resources or this process needs resources okay and once it has the resources so it is now in ready state okay next state is running so after the ready state so you've got the running state there the CPU is working on its process instructions now and then waiting here waiting is caused by an IO or an event wait okay or an IO completion so and then that would go to ready and then running again now waiting is the process cannot run at the moment because it is waiting for some resource to become available or for some event to occur so for example the process may be waiting for a keyboard input or disk access request or enter process messages okay a timer go off or a child process to finish so that is a waiting state all right so next would be terminated so the process has completed its operation all right next now let's talk about the process control block okay so what is a process control block so it has the information associated with each process this is also called the task control block or tcb okay so for each of the process there okay so we have what you call a process control block so pcb which stores the following types of process specific information such as the process state, the process number, the program counter, registers, memory limits, and the list of open files. Okay, so the process state is basically the running, waiting. Okay, so we discussed in the previous slide. Okay, so next would be the process number. Okay, so the process number is basically the process ID or the parent process ID. You also have the program counter okay so the program counter this needs to be saved and restored when swapping processes in and out of the CPU okay the location of the instruction next to execute okay next would be the CPU registers okay and that is the contents of all the process centric registers you've got the CPU scheduling information also so this includes the first in first out okay so the priorities if it is a round robin and other cpu scheduling algorithm all right so next would be the memory management information okay so example of this are page tables or segment tables so we will be discussing that in the 
latter chapter of this uh, discussion or, or of this book or course. Okay. So next one would be the accounting information. It is a user and kernel CPU time consumed. Okay. Account numbers, limits, etc. And the last one would be the IO status information. So the devices allocated, the open file tables, etc. Okay. Next, threads. You have seen threads earlier on our um, uh, task manager. Let me bring up again my task manager here. Okay. So you'll see threads here. Now, what is a thread? So thread basically are sub processes. So take note that when you execute a process, when you execute a program, okay, making it a process, there are sub processes associated with that main process, and we call it threads. Okay. So a good example of threads are the sub processes associated with Microsoft Word. All right. So let me open a Microsoft Word. All right. So WinWord. Let me open it. So you'll see that on the taskbar, I have opened Microsoft Word, okay? And see what happened to the number of threads here. So it dramatically increases because inside that process or Microsoft Word process, there are sub processes there like uh, spell checker, the grammar check, um, letter counters, word counters, etc. So these services are in a form of threads. And we will be talking about threads in the next chapter of this presentation right or in the next chapter of the book let me close again that uh, ms word all right so so far process has been a single thread of execution so consider having multiple program counters per process so you're gonna have multiple threads of control right so we must have then a storage for thread details multiple program counters in the process control block or PCB okay again so we have a detailed discussion of threads on the next chapter of the course okay next so this is a process representation in Linux okay so we're in the current process the currently executing process is in here okay you've got the struct task struct process information okay so this is how processes are represented in Linux. And this represents or represented by the C structure task struct. Okay. So we will not be dealing with the um, OS specific here. So we just want to get into the operating system concepts that are applicable on any of the operating systems. So, well, there are some features here that might be unique with the specific operating systems. All right. So the next thing would be the process scheduling or the CPU scheduling, okay? So a process scheduler selects among available processes for the next execution of the CPU or on the CPU core. So the goal here is to maximize the CPU use. In other terms, we have to keep the CPU as busy as possible. So we always want to get 100% of CPU utilization here and quickly switch processes onto the CPU core. So the two main objective of process scheduling systems, first are to keep the CPU busy at all times, and second, deliver acceptable response times for all the program, particularly for interactive ones. Right? So I'll repeat, there are two objectives or main objectives of process scheduling. So the first one is we have to keep the CPU as busy as possible, okay? Keep the CPU busy at all times and deliver acceptable response for all the programs, particularly for interactive ones, all right? So the process scheduler must meet these objectives by implementing suitable policies for swapping processes in and out of the CPU, okay? So note that these objectives can be conflicting in particular Every time the system steps into a swap process, it takes up time on the CPU to do so, which thereby lost from doing any useful productive work. Okay? So aside from that, the process scheduler maintains scheduling queues of a process. So you've got the ready queues and the waiting queues. Okay? So what's the difference between these two? 
When you say ready queue, these are set of all processes residing in the main memory, ready and waiting to be executed. Okay? And when you say wait queue, these are set of processes waiting for an event to occur, for example, an I.O. Right? So processes migrate from among the various queues depending upon the state of the process. Okay? So I have here the ready and waiting queues. Okay, so sometimes when the process is preempted, okay, so it will be going back to the RAM. Okay, so ready and waiting for the next execution time. So all processes are basically stored in the job queue. Okay, or process queue. Okay, so next would be process is in the ready state. They are placed in the ready queue. Right, so processes waiting for a, a device to become available to deliver data are placed in the device queues. So we have a lot of queues here. These are generally a separate device for queue for each of the device there. So other queues are also be created and used as needed. All right. Okay. So next would be the representation of a process scheduling. Okay. So for the schedulers, we have what you call a long-term scheduler. This is a typical batch of system or a very heavily loaded system. It runs infrequently, such as when one process and selecting one more to be loaded in from a disk in its place and can afford to take the time to implement intelligent and advanced CPU scheduling algorithm. Okay, so that's long-term scheduler. We also have a short-term scheduler. Another term for that is CPU scheduler. Okay, so the CPU scheduler runs very frequently on the order of 100 milliseconds and must be very quickly swap one process out of the CPU and swap in another one. So some systems are also employ a medium term scheduler. So when the system loads gets high, this scheduler will swap one or more processes out of the ready queue for a few seconds. So in order to allow smaller, faster jobs to finish. So and clear the system. So next would be an efficient scheduling system will be select or will select a good process mix of the CPU bound process and an IO bound process. Okay, now take a look at the CPU scheduling here. So, whenever you run an application, okay, so basically that application will be placed on the ready queue. So, ready queue that means the process is now on the RAM ready for the execution. Okay, it already has the resources needed maybe for the execution. So, on the ready state, it will be forwarded to the CPU for execution. These processes are executed by the CPU one at a time. All right, so one at a time. So it's a matter of milliseconds. All right, now if the process burst time, okay, so when I say burst time here, okay, burst time is the amount of time needed by the process to complete the execution. So for instance, that process has already served the burst time. So that means the process state would be terminated. Okay. Now, on the CPU, if the process is currently executed, it can be preempted. So, we say preempted, during the execution, it can be pulled out from the CPU. And if it is not yet done, it has to fall in line back again to the ready queue. Now, what would be that instances wherein the process can be preempted from the CPU execution? So, these are the following. So there might be an I.O. request coming from the keyboard. All right. So that would lead to an I.O. wait queue. You've got an I.O. there. So the process will be on going back to the ready queue. Or maybe you are using a round robin CPU scheduling and the time slice has expired. So when you say when you say time slice, this is similar to the term quantum. Okay, and quantum is the amount of time given to a process to stay in the CPU for execution. All right, so we call it time slice. Next, 
Another instance that the process can be preempted from the execution on the CPU would be there is a child process that needs to be executed. And when the child termination wait queue for that process, so the child will be terminated and again, that process will be going back to the re ready queue for the next execution time. Okay? And the last one would be the wait for an interrupt here. So there might be an interrupt during the execution of the process. That's why it was preempted and therefore placed into the ready queue. All right. So that's how process works inside the CPU between the memory or the RAM and the CPU. All right. Next, let's talk about the CPU switch from one process to another. Okay. So take note that the CPU can execute one job at a time. For example, we have two processes here, namely P0 and P1. It could be any applications on your computer. Let's say this is Microsoft Word here for P0 and P1 is for PowerPoint. Okay. So what happened, what happened here is that, for example, at the current time or at time zero, okay, process zero is being executed. Okay. So because of the interrupt or system call, okay, so P0 will be stored or save the state into the PCB for process zero. Take note that each process has their own process control block. All right. So what will happen is, okay, so if there is an interrupt here, there might be the instance or an instance wherein the process is idle waiting for another chance of execution. So on this area here, the process is in the waiting queue or in the ready queue. So that means they are idle. Okay. Now, if one process is idle, there might be another process that is currently being executed. Okay. And when you say CPU switch from one process to the other. Okay. So take note that the CPU is processing one process or one job at a time. So if the process is not able to finish the execution or if the burst time has not been served and it has been preempted. Okay. So that's the time the CPU is executing another process here. Okay. So take a look at this. At this time, P0 is executed, and then you've got idle state here. Now, while it is in idle state, process 1 is currently being executed. Okay? So, a context switch occurs when the CPU switches from one process to another. So, that scenario is what you call context switch. Alright? So, what is a context switch? So, when CPU switches to another process, the system must save the state of the old process and load the saved state of the new process via context switch. Okay, so context of a process is represented in the PCB. Okay, so whenever an interrupt arrives, the CPU must do a state save of the currently running process, then switch into a kernel mode to handle the interrupt. And then do a state restore of the interrupt process so that's how it works so similarly okay so a context switch of course when the time slice for one process has expired we're talking about round robin here okay and a new process is to be loaded from the ready queue okay so this will be instigated by the timer interrupt which will then cause the current process state to be saved and the new process state to be restored okay so we have a lot of event that is happening during the context switch so saving and restoring states involve saving and restoring all of the registers and program counters as well as the process control block described earlier okay so context switching happens in a very very frequently and the overhead of doing the switching is just lost CPU time so context switches states, saves, and restores need to be fast as possible because during the context switch, during the movement from one process to another, the CPU is doing nothing. So some hardware has special provisions for speeding this up, such as single machine instruction for saving and restoring all registers at once. 
all right so can you now imagine how the operating systems manages this process process switching okay you've got requests coming from the processes okay so that's hell of an activity all right so next would be the multitasking in mobile system okay so let's talk about an ios here so some mobile systems example the early versions of ios okay allow only one process to run and then others are suspended so we look at it as multitasking because multiple processes are being executed but they are not executed all at the same time all right so as what i said earlier the concept here is that the cpu can execute process one uh, one job at a time okay or one process at a time so due to screen real estate user interface limits ios provides for a single foreground process controlled by uh, user interface and multiple background processes so these are in the memory running but not on the display and with its limits okay so for android android runs foreground and background with fewer limits so background processes uses a service to perform tasks okay while the service can keep running even if the background processes is suspended so service has no user interface and it uses only a small amount of memory okay next so operations on the processes so systems must provide mechanism for process creation and process termination okay now let's talk about process creation first so in process creation there might be a parent process creating a child or children processes which in turn create other processes forming a, a, a tree of processes you've got the parent you've got the uh, root and then you've got different branches and then each branch has a tree or has a leaf or leaf okay so that forms a tree of a process so generally process identified and managed via process identifier so resource sharing options is available so the parent and the children share all the resources so we're talking about process and thread relationships here okay so children share subset of the parent resources or the parent and child share no resources at all okay now on the execution options so the parent and children execute concurrently all at the same time okay so next would be the parent waits until the children terminate can we terminate the parent without terminating the children or the child first the answer is no okay we have to ensure or the operating system has to ensure that all the children processes has ended before we terminate a parent okay next process creation so the child duplicate of parent this is in terms of outer space and the child has a program loaded into it so in unix okay when you say fork this is a system call that creates a new process okay so basically everything in an operating system so if you want the operating uh, operating system to do something you just have to issue a system call okay a system call to execute or to create a new process a system call to close the application or terminate the application so basically everything in the operating system is in the principle of system calls okay and in unix to create a new process means fork okay exec is a system call for uh, executing the program okay so after the fork so the process is replaced from the memory space with a new program so we call it exec so the parent process calls wait waiting for the child to terminate all right next so you've got a tree of processes in linux so we have mentioned about the tree of processes earlier okay so um, processes may create other process 
through appropriate system calls such as fork or spawn. Okay, so the process which does the creating is termed the parent of the other process, so which is termed as its child. Okay, so each process is given an integer identifier. Okay, we, we have here a process ID or the PID. Okay. So the parent PID is also stored on each of the process. Okay. So on a typical Unix systems, the process scheduler is termed sched and is given a PID of zero. All right. So the first thing it does at system startup time is to launch init or initialize, which gives the process PID equals one. Okay, the init or initialize then launches all system daemons and user logins and becomes the ultimate parent for all the processes here. Okay, so depending on the system implementation, a system process may receive some amount of shared resources with its parent. So the child processes may or may not be limited to subsets of the resources originally allocated to the parent. So preventing runaway children from consuming all of certain system resources. All right. Okay, so I have here a C program for King separate process. So this is written in C, okay. So it shows a typical process tree for Linux system and other systems will have similar though not identical trees okay referring to the previous diagram okay next would be creating a separate process via the windows api okay so mostly the operating systems are made of or made from the c or c, c language c plus plus okay so in here it shows more complicated process for windows okay so you'll have sort of um pointers all right or memory by reference which must provide all the parameter information for new process as part of the forking process okay next would be process termination so how do we terminate a process so we just close the application okay then we are terminating a process so process may be terminated by the system for a variety of reasons including first the inability of the system to deliver necessary system resources. Okay. In response to a kill command or other unhandled process interrupt. So the parent may kill its children if the task assigned to them is no longer needed. So again, we say kill here. Okay. So we mean termination. We mean we close the application. Okay. So on Unix systems, or PAND processes are generally inherited by init, which then proceeds to kill them. The Unix no hop command allows a child to continue executing after the parent has exited. Okay, so um, that is in the process termination concepts in Unix. All right, next, when a process terminates, all of its system resources are freed up open files flashed and closed okay so the process termination status and execution times are returned to the parent if the parent is waiting for the child to terminate or eventually returned to init if the process becomes an orphan okay so we have here the term orphan process which are trying to terminate but which cannot because their parent is not wanting for them and termed zombies okay so if no parent is waiting did not invoke the wait the process is what we call a zombie if the parent is terminated without invoking wait the process is called an orphan okay so these are eventually inherited by init as orphans and killed off so note that modern unix shells do not produce as many orphans and zombies as the older systems do. Alright, so we have that term zombie and orphan. Okay. 
So next would be the Android process importance hierarchy. Okay. So mobile operating system often have to terminate the process to reclaim the system resources such as the memory from most to least important. So foreground process, visible process, service processes, background and empty processes. Okay. So Android will begin terminating the process that are least important. Okay. So take note that maybe you are experiencing a fast uh, low bat on a mobile devices and maybe without noticing it you have a lot of processes running on your system okay so we can store we, we can save the resource okay by closing the applications which you don't need okay so and with that okay so we are freeing the resources specifically the RAM all right Next, let's talk about the multi-process architecture. So let's talk about the Chrome browser, okay? So many websites active content such as JavaScript, Flash, HTML5, okay? So to provide rich media and dynamic web browsing experience. Unfortunately, this web application may contain software bugs, which result in sluggish response and can never cause the browser to cross okay now the google chrome browser is a multi-process with three different types of processes okay you've got a browser okay so process manages user interface disk and network io you also have the renderer okay so the process renders web pages deals with html and javascript a new renderer created for each website opened okay runs in sandbox restricting disk and io or specifically the network io minimizing the effect of the security exploits all right so the advantage of a multi-process approach is that the website run in isolation from one computer so if the website crosses it only okay affects or only each renderer process is affected okay so all other processes remained unharmed so furthermore renderer process which is mentioned earlier running in a sandbox which means that the access to disk and network io is restricted okay minimizing the effects of any security exploits here okay so each tab in a chrome represents a separate process Okay, next, let's talk about IPC or the inter-process communication. So the process within a system may be independent or cooperating. Okay, so when you say cooperating, these are process, okay, so wherein it can affect or be affected by other processes, including sharing data. So the reasons for cooperating processes are information sharing, computation speed up, modularity, and convenience. Okay. So cooperating process needs the inter-process communication or IPC, which are represented using the two models. No? So which are the shared memory and the message passing. Okay. Now, when you say independent process, so operating con concurrently on the systems are those that can neither affect other processes or be affected by the other processes as mentioned here. Okay. Now, on the three zones, what is information sharing in cooperating process? So there may be several processes which need access to the same file. For example, okay, example are pipelines. Okay, so computation speed up. So often, a solution to a problem can be solved faster if the problem can be broken down into subtasks. Okay. To be solved simultaneously so particularly when multiple processors are involved here okay modularity the most efficient architecture may be to break the system down into cooperating modules so example databases with a client server architecture okay and the last one would be convenience okay what is convenience in cooperating process so even a single user may be multitasking such as editing, compiling, printing, and running at the same code, 
in different windows. So that's convenient. Okay, now let's see the model mentioned here, the shared and the message passing. Okay, now cooperating process requires some uh, type of the inter-process communication, which is mostly one of these two. Okay, the shared memory or the message passing systems. Okay, now what's the difference between these two? When you say shared memory, this is faster once it is set up. So because no system calls are required and access occurs at a normal memory speeds. So however, it is more complicated to set up and it doesn't work as well across multiple computers. So shared memory is generally preferable when large amounts of information must be shared quickly on the same computer. Okay. Now, for the message passing, it requires system calls for every message transfer. Okay? And it's therefore slower, but it is simpler to set up and works well with multiple computers or across multiple computers. So, message passing is generally preferable when the amount and or frequency of data transfer is small or when multiple computers are in fault. Okay? So, that is when the message passing is uh, useful okay next let's talk about the producer consumer problem okay so the paradigm for cooperating process so the producer process produces information that is consumed by the consumer process so there are two variations here okay it could be the unbounded proper uh, buffer or the bounded buffer okay so for these two variations when you say unbounded buffer there is no practical limit on the size of the buffer so the producer never waits and the consumer waits if there is no buffer to consume okay on the bounded buffer it assumes that there is a fixed buffer size so the producer must wait if all buffers are full the, the consumer waits if there is no buffer to consume. So this is a classic example in which one process is producing data and another process is consuming data. Okay? So in this example, in the order in which it is produced, although that could vary. Okay? So the data is passed via an intermediary buffer, which may be either bounded or unbounded okay so with bounded buffer the producer may have to wait until there is a space available okay but when an unbounded buffer the producer the producer will never need to wait okay so the consumer may need to wait in either case until there is a data available okay so that is producer consumer problem Okay, so we will be using this producer-consumer problem on the discussion of deadlocks. Okay? Now, the inter-process communication for the shared memory, okay, so an area of memory shared among the process that wish to communicate. So the communication is under the control of the users. Okay? Major issues to provide mechanisms that will allow the user processes to synchronize their action when they access shared memory. So synchronization is discussed in great details in chapter six and seven. All right. Next, how about the bounded buffer, the shared memory solution? So this example uses a shared memory and a circular queue. So note in the code, okay, that only the producer changes in, okay? and only the consumer changes out okay so and they can never be accessing the same array location at the same time so first the following data is set up in the shared memory area okay so the solution is correct but it can uh, only use a buffer size minus one element okay next then the producer process 
note that the buffer is full when in is one less than out in circular sense okay next the consumer process note that the buffer is empty when in is equal to out okay so next what about filling all the buffers would that be possible okay so, so, so suppose that we wanted to provide a solution to the consumer producer problem that fills all the buffers what can we do so or we can do so by having an integer counter that keeps track of the number of full buffers so initially the counter is set to zero the integer counter is incremented by the producer after it produces a new buffer and the integer counter is and is decremented by the consumer after it consumes the buffer okay so you'll have this produce an item in the next produced this is for the producer okay and for the consumer you'll have this so if there is a resource available then it needs to be consumed okay so the next one would be the race condition. So what is a race condition? Anytime there is or there are two or more processes or threads operating concurrently, there is a potential for a particularly difficult class of problems. We call it race condition. Okay? So the identifying characteristics of race conditions is that the performance varies depending on which process or thread executes their instructions before the other one and this becomes a problem when the program runs correctly in some instance and incorrectly in others okay so race conditions are notoriously difficult to debug because they are unpredictable unrepeatable and may not exhibit themselves for years okay okay so um, next note that the above solution also checks the return value from the read system call so to verify the number of characters read is equal to the number expected okay some of those checks were actually in the original code but they were omitted from the notes for clarity okay and the real code also uses select before reading okay so to verify that there are characters present to read and to delay if not okay so note also that this problem could not be easily solved using synchronization tools that we're going to discuss in chapter 6 because the problem is not really one of two processes accessing the same data at the same time okay so these problems here about synchronization will be discussed in detail and thoroughly on the next few chapters the next two chapters okay specifically okay so next would be the interprocess communication the message passing message passing systems must support a minimum system calls for send message and receive message so you'll have this all right so these are the ipc facility operations okay so process communicate with each other without resorting to shared variables okay so the message size is either fixed or variable okay so a communication link okay so take note that we have your established communication link okay so a communication link must be established between the cooperating processes before messages can be sent so there are three key issues to be resolved in message passing systems as further explored in the next three subsections okay so we have the direct or indirect communication naming synchronous or asynchronous communication and automatic or explicit buffering okay so this summarizes these issues here now let's talk about the implementations of the communication link so it's either implemented in physical or logical okay in physical we have the shared memory the hardware bus and the network implementation logically 
you could have direct or indirect synchronous or asynchronous and automatic or explicit buffering okay now with direct communication okay the sender must know the name of the receiver to which it wishes to send message so for symmetric communication the receiver must also know the specific name of the sender from which it wishes to receive messages well for asy uh, asymmetric there is or this is not necessary okay now for indirect communications all right so indirect communication uses shared mailboxes or ports all right so multiple processes can share that uh, mailbox or boxes so only one process can read any given message in a mailbox so initially process that creates the mailbox is the owner and is the only one allowed to read mail in that mailbox although this privilege may be transferred okay so of course the process that reads the message can immediately turn around and place an identical message back in the box for someone else to read but that may put it at the back end of the queue messages okay so the os provides system calls to create and delete mailboxes and to send and receive messages to or from the mailboxes all right so that's indirect communication okay so this is what i mentioned earlier now next is how about mailbox sharing as mentioned earlier for example you've got p1 p2 and p3 share mailbox a so p1 sends p2 and p3 receive who gets the message okay so solution would be allow a link to be associated with most or at most two processes allow only one process at a time to execute a receive operation allow the system to select arbitrarily the receiver sender is not or is notified who the receiver was okay that's indirect communication next would be synchronization okay so synchronization either the sending or receiving of messages or neither or both me either blocking or non-blocking okay next so the producer consumer message passing okay so what do we have here the producer produce an item in the next produced and then send next produced on the consumer side okay so while true same thing with that of the producer receive next consumed okay and then of course the consumed the item in the next consumed Okay, so that's the implementation of message passing on that problem. Okay, so next would be buffering. Okay, so queue of messages attached to the link implemented in one of three ways. So you've got the zero capacity, bounded capacity, and unbounded capacity. Okay, so we say zero capacity, messages cannot be stored in the queue or senders must block until receivers accept the message okay or the bounded capacity there is a certain predetermined finite capacity in the queue senders must block if the queue is full until the space becomes available in the in the queue but maybe either blocking or non-blocking otherwise okay so unbounded capacity the queue has a theoretical infinite capacity so senders can never force to block okay next so we have here an example of interprocess communications in unix okay so the POSIX. so for the implementation of the shared memory the, uh, the process first creates a shared memory segment also used to open an existing segment and then set the size of the object okay so we use uh, mnap to memory map okay so a file pointer to a shared memory object 
So reading and writing to shared memory is done by using the pointer returned memory map or mmap. Okay? So this is the complete program implementing the shared memory on a POSIX systems. Okay? This is the continuation. Earlier, this is the POSIX implementation on the producer and the POSIX implementation on the consumer. Okay? Now, how about on other operating systems like Mac? Okay? So, Mac communication is message-based. So, even system calls are messages. Each task gets two ports at creation. So, you get kernel and notify. Okay? So, the kernel sends notification of events to the notify mailbox. Three system calls are used for message transfer. You've got message send sends a message to a mailbox. Message receive receives a message. And message RPC sends a message and waits for exactly one message in response from the sender. So the port allocate creates a new mailbox and associated queue for holding messages. So the default size is 8. All right. Next, only one task at a time can own or receive message from any given mailbox, but these are transferable. So messages from the same sender to the same receiver are guaranteed to arrive in the first in first out order, but no guarantees are made regarding messages from multiple senders. Okay, so messages consist of a fixed length header followed by a variable length data the header contains mailbox number okay or just the address of the receiver and the sender so the section or data section consists of a list of type data items each containing a type size and value okay now here's the implementation of message passing on the client okay client code on mac okay so if the receiver's mailbox is full the sender has four choices okay so wait indefinitely until there is a room in the mailbox wait at most n milliseconds okay so or do not wait at all okay so temporarily cache the message with the kernel for delivery when the mailbox becomes available so only one such message can be pending at any given time from any given sender to any given receiver. So normally, only used by certain system tasks, such as the print spooler, which must notify the client for the completion of their job, but cannot wait around for the mailbox to become available. Okay, so we have a lot of technical terms and technical discussions here. Okay, next. So, receive calls must specify the mailbox or mailbox set from which they wish to receive message. Okay? So, port status. Okay? So, the, the port status reports the number of messages waiting at any given mailbox. So, if there are no messages available in the mailbox, so we're using set, the receiver can either block for n milliseconds or not block at all. So in order to avoid delays caused by copying messages multiple times, okay, Mac remaps the memory space for the message from the sender uh, address space to the receiver's address space. So using virtual memory techniques to be covered on the next chapter that we have. Okay, so it does not actually move the message anywhere at all. So when the sending and receiving tasks are both on the same computer. Okay, so that's the implementation for Mac. How about the implementation for Windows? Okay, so for Windows, message passing centric via Advanced Local Procedures Call or the LPC facility. Okay, it only works between processes on the same system. Okay, so it uses ports like mailbox. So ports here pertains to the socket okay socket 
or communication socket. Okay? So in, in other operating systems that we discussed, they call it mailboxes to establish and maintain communication channels. Alright? So communication works as follows. So the client open a handle to subsystems connection port object. The client sends a connection request. The server creates two private communication ports and returns the handle to one of the client. So the client and server use a corresponding port handle to send message or callbacks and to listen for replies. Okay. Now in here, we have the local procedure calls in Windows. Okay. So if you will observe here, it establishes connections from the client going to the server. Okay. So and it uses uh, different procedure calls to do the tasks. All right. Okay, so next are pipes. So what are pipes? Pipes are one of the earliest and simplest channel of communication between Unix processes. Okay, so there are four key considerations for implementing pipes. First, unidirectional or bidirectional communication. Right. Next is is by directional operation or communication half duplex or full duplex okay now next would be must a relationship such as parent child exist between the processes okay and last is can pipes communicate over a network or only on the same machine so the following sections examine these issues on unix and windows so you've got what you call an ordinary pipes and the name pipes okay now let's talk about the ordinary pipes here ordinary pipes are unidirectional with a reading end and writing end so if bidirectional meaning two-way okay communications are needed then a second pipe is required okay so Unix pipes are accessible as files using the standard read and write system calls. So the ordinary pipes are only accessible within the process that created them. So typically, a, pro a parent okay, creates the pipe before forking off a child. So when the child inherits open files from each parent, including the pipe files, a channel of communication is established. So each process, parent and child, should first close the ends of the pipe that they are not using. So for example, if the parent is waiting to the pipe and the child is reading, then the parent should close the reading end of each pipe after the fork and the child should close the writing end. So in Windows, Windows calls this anonymous pipes. So ordinary pipes in Unix, anonymous pipes in Windows. Okay, next, how about the named pipes? So named pipes support bidirectional communication. So communication between a non-parent child related process and persistence after the process which created them exists. So multiple processes can also share a named pipe, typically one reader and multiple writers okay so in unix named pipes are termed pfos okay appear as ordinary files in the system so in windows named pipes provide richer communications duplex specifically full duplex is supported so process may reside on the same or different machines and created and manipulated using the create named pipe, connect named pipe, read file, and write file system calls. Okay? Alright, so a lot of technical terms and technical discussions, okay, all about processes, okay, and a lot more technical discussions on the next chapter. Okay? Now, communications in a client-server systems. So how do we communicate computers, which are said to be the client, to the server, which is the provider of service? Okay, so we have two. It's either we use sockets 
or the remote procedure calls. Sackets earlier is termed as port or mailboxes. Okay. Now, what is a socket? So, a socket is defined as an endpoint for communication. A socket is an endpoint for communication. So, that means every application that is capable of having a communication over the network has a socket. Example, when you use or when you browse the internet, you are using HTTP. So, you are using a port 80 socket. Or if it is an HTTPS, you are using a port 443 socket. Okay, so two process communications are communicating over the network often use a pair of connected sockets as mentioned earlier. So software that is designed for a client server operation may also use sockets for communication between two processes running on the same computer. For example, the UI for a database program may communicate with a backend database manager using sockets. Again, when you say sockets, just to make it clear, sockets are port numbers. These are the address of the applications residing on your computer. Okay, so if your computer has a physical address called MAC address and a logical address called IP address, your computer's application or the application inside your computer has what's called address named socket or port. Okay. Next. So this is an example of a socket communication. Okay, so if you'll observe here, we have here a socket 1625 and a socket um, 80. Right? So you've got the communication between the host at 1468520 communicating to the server at 1621251998. Okay? So take note that with socket communication, okay? So it is not only the IP address which is being used in the process, but it includes or integrates the port number or socket numbers. Okay, so in Cisco, we are dealing with a lot of port numbers, especially when we're talking about the access lists. Okay, so the communication channels via sockets may be one or uh, two of the major forms. Okay, it's either TCP, connection oriented. Transmission Control Protocol, and UDP. So I guess you, you remember already what are these sockets for. Okay? Now, sockets in Java. So there are three types of sockets. As mentioned earlier, you've got the connection-oriented TCP. It is a reliable communication. Okay, so there it's, a re it's called reliable because this requires an acknowledgement. Okay, connectionless are UDP. This is said to be non-reliable, but Java has this multicast socket. Okay, so data can be sent to multiple recipients. Okay, so sockets are considered a low-level communication channel, and process may often choose to use something at a higher level, such as those covered in the next two sections. Okay. Now, the figure client-server systems illustrated here, okay, so for determining the current date using sockets in Java, okay? Now, next would be the remote procedure calls or RPCs, okay? So, remote procedure call abstracts procedure calls between process or processes of a network systems. Again, uses ports for service differentiation. Again, so don't be confused with the ports, sockets, mailbox, they are all the same. Okay? Next, the general concept of RPC is to make procedure calls similarly to calling on ordinary local procedures in programming, except the procedure being called lies on a remote machine. So implementation involves what you call stubs. Okay? On either end of the communication so the local process calls on the stub much as it would call upon a local procedure so the RPC system package up marshals okay the parameters of the procedure call and transmits them to the remote system 
On the other remote uh, side, the RPC daemon accepts the parameters and calls upon the appropriate uh, remote procedure to perform the requested work. So any results to be returned from the package up and sent back to the RPC systems to the local system. So which then unpackages and returns the result to the local calling procedures. So on Windows, this tab code compile from a specification written in the Microsoft Interface Definition Language, RMITL. Okay. Next. So um, one potential difficulty is the formatting of data on local versus remote systems. Okay. So the resolution of this problem generally involves an agreed upon intermediary format such as the XDR. Okay, or the external data representation. All right. So another issue is identifying the procedure on the remote system, particularly the RPC is distant for. So remote procedure calls are identified by ports, though not the same ports as the sockets port described earlier. Okay. So one solution is for the calling procedures to know the port number they wish to communicate with on the remote system. So this is problematic as the port number would be compiled into code and it makes it break down if the remote systems cannot change their port numbers. Okay, so more commonly matchmakers process is employed which acts like a telephone directory service. Okay, so the local process must first contact the matchmaker of the remote system so at a well-known port numbers okay so which looks up the desired port number and returns it so the local process can then choose and use that information to contact direct remote procedure so this operation involves an extra step but is more flexible okay so an example of the matchmaker process is illustrated here okay so this is how the client and the server communicate with each other by using the remote procedure calls so one common example of the system based on RPC calls is the network file system okay messages are passed to read write delete rename or check status or might be for ordinary local disk access requests okay so we have a long day with a discussion of this chapter because we have a lot of technical discussions and technical terms here okay so and so much for the next chapter so that's the end of the video thank you for sticking around have a great day